everybody, and welcome to another episode of Crime Documents. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. That was beyond ridiculous. And that was your idea. Yeah, no, that was funny as funny as that was great. That was that was great. What are you talking about? That That was was awesome. Yeah, it was pretty good. (laughs) Do the other one. Um yeah, the other one. Yeah, listen to this guys. This is great. Hey there. Hey everybody. If you wanna see you wanna see crime documentaries. Do uh yeah. little what's uh what's that singer's name who's got the really really low voice? Oh my gosh, I forgot his name. I know do exactly Darth, what you're talking about. Do Darth Vader. Oh my god, yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> do Darth Vader. <laughs> Duke, I am your father. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that's great okay that's enough awesome. of this anyway guys no, sorry we're having awesome. too much fun yeah no yeah. for the people for the people on the uh podcast side of things uh aj's got a little uh a fun little toy yeah connected to his soundboard which is yep. awesome so yeah what, what but what is that singer's name the one with a oh. really really low voice I can't um, think of it offhand. What's if name? anyone knows, put it in the comments because honestly, I'm stumped. Oh God, what was his name? Because you sound that sounded a lot like him. Did so, it? May, you know what? Because and I know you can sing, so, so maybe, maybe I should do that. Yeah, sing a little bit for us. Go ahead. No, no, not no, no. That. Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> like, oh, oh, I know who you're talking about. Actually, ready? Like, yeah, yeah. Hold on. What's what's the song? Hold on. What what's that Christmas song? You know what I'm talking about? It's like no. uh I don't know. There's chestnuts roasting on an open fire. <laughs> it makes you sound so stupid. <laughs> yeah. It makes yeah. you sound so stupid if you try to sing because yeah. it's trying to like fluctuate the pitch. So it's yeah. terrible. Well but yeah, you know, that's good stuff. But I will let people know in the audience that AJ Hola. can AJ really can sing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're seeing that? Yeah, I'm seeing that, oh, baby. Are... Hola. Hola. Yeah, that's, Thank you for uh, coming in and watching. Yeah. I, uh, her name is uh, uh, Ilana. I- Ileana? Ileana, I think. Yes. Ileana. Hi, Al. sure? Yes. All right. Hi, Al. I'm going to leave think... it to you because if I screw it up, she's going to kill both of us. So I'm just going <laughs> to let you do it. See? Hola. Am I right? Nice to meet nice you. To meet... Yeah, nice to meet you. Very nice. Um, First time in the room, I think. Yeah, well, very nice. So uh, hey. we we see. see so you. she said I'll see. So that means obviously yes. I yeah. said it right, yeah. and yeah. Uh, that was good, Ileana. Yeah. So uh, thank you for thank you for stopping by. Um, yeah, we yeah. really don't have much to say. We just no. We're gonna know. jump into this yeah. documentary, yeah. but we have just a couple of things we're gonna talk about probably. But other than that, yeah. Whoa, that was nice. Well, that was cool. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. Hey, how you doing? Hey, hey. Hey, Eliana. How you you doing? doing? Yeah, yeah. So. No, sorry. I had to mess um, around. had to mess around. Anything going on? Is there anything you want to talk about before we move forward here? You know, not too much, man. I just want to give a shout out real quick that we are live right now on Parapost Network Central. If anybody doesn't know Parapost Network Central, head over there live on Facebook every Sunday night, 7 p.m. We show documentaries of crime cases that are fascinating, very heinous, and just downright wrong sometimes. And you know what? It's great to bring it out in the open because some things need to be discussed, and that's the reason why we do this show. So uh, what else do you have to say, brother? Well, apparently she's seducing both of us. I know. I know. Yeah. This how is you bad. Doing? How, hey, you, how doing? you doing? How <laughs> yeah. you doing? Uh, what? yeah. So we got it. We actually, uh, I saw this one. I, I've been going back and forth on two. Okay. All week. And finally, uh, finally I decided last night, okay, let's show this one. Cause we haven't really shown something like this before. So yeah. this is this is a good one. I watched some of it, not all of it, but I watched some of it. So 
I wa- I think I watched the first twenty or the first fifteen minutes of it, and it was it was really good. So um, this is why we're watching it today, uh, Carmen, Carmen Thomas. Um, real, real unfortunate uh, tragedy that happened to her. Uh, she was kidnapped and obviously murdered. And I was just reading a little bit of info. She was actually uh, last seen on June 27th. Um, it doesn't say the year, but I'm sure we're going to say that see this in the uh, in the video. But that's the day after my birthday. Oh no way! Yeah. So and oh. uh, they believe that she was murdered two days after she was. Oh. Well, I guess. Well, you know what? I won't say she was really taken or kidnapped. Uh, I'll. You guys can just watch the the video and. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I'm sad because she was obviously a very attractive woman and and uh, gone gone too soon, unfortunately. So let's start up the video and I hope you guys enjoy this. Thank you, Pam, for sharing it out. Thanks, I appreciate Pam. That. And thank you for stopping by. And uh, I just noticed a buddy is in the room. Who? Oh. Um, Mr. Chris Ludziak. Oh. And uh, he's an, uh, a very good friend of mine. Great. And uh, yeah, nice to see him in the room. Awesome. Uh, I hope you stick around, Chris. I hope you have some time. So basically what we do, we show documentaries on uh, true crime stuff. So here we go. This is on Carmen Thomas. Here we go, guys. Shadows of Love. Shadows of Love, yes. Operation Keppel, a missing persons case that rapidly becomes suspected murder when blood spatter is found in her apartment. Police have a prime suspect, but no body. What has happened? Where is the evidence? And will science provide the crucial links in solving the case? A crime scene is a puzzle that has to be solved. A whodunit, a scattering of clues to be deciphered by clever detective work and the power of science. In the suburban streets of Hamilton, a resident investigates a car that appears to be abandoned. They found it strange just the way it was set there, unlocked, and um, from what they saw in the car, they thought, oh, this is not right, so they rang police. The car wasn't reported stolen, but the registered owner, 30-year-old single parent Carmen Thomas, had failed to make the scheduled pickup of her child. The following day, she's reported missing. The circumstances of the car being left in Hamilton, abandoned, and then also the fact uh, Carmen hadn't come back to her child suggested something wasn't right. Immediately, Detective Inspector Mark Benefield sensed this was more than just a simple missing persons case. The alarm bells were ringing. Um, the sixth sense, you know, your gut feeling that you have a true experience. It had a feel about it that suggested that we need to get onto this urgently. Police canvassed the area for further information regarding the vehicle and its missing owner. It's basically identifying any witnesses that may have seen the car being parked there, her, her exiting the car or any involvement around the car. Uh, when did they first notice the car being in their street? Speak to everyone on the street and identify anyone in the household that may have seen something. The car is taken back to Auckland and examined by ESR scientists for clues as to what had happened to its owner. We were looking at whether there's any indications that something sinister has occurred uh, in the car. The items in the car themselves look like the kind of car um, any one of us could have, with the exception of the fact she had a, a packed suitcase in the back. We went through um, the items that were in there, we itemised them out and, and looked at them all, them all, and we found there was blood staining on, on two of the items. In both cases, the DNA profile came back as Miss Thomas. Um, she's allowed to have her own blood on her own clothes. What we don't know is whether that's come from an event that's unrelated to, to her disappearance. DNA samples were taken from various places in the car to determine if anyone else other than Carmen had driven it recently. We didn't get any useful results from that. We're unable to actually answer that for them. 
In the glove box were two clues to the last people to have seen Carmen. There were two notes found in the car, quite different in context, but linked, linked in the sense of they sort of linked to Carmen's um, occupation. One was regarding a debt that needed to be paid. Once we established who that note came from, we completed interviews in and around that person, and uh, they, they told us what they did and how it came about. That note was regarding a debt to a manager of an escort agency. The second contained cash. And it suggested that she was paid some money for services. And it was addressed to Misty. Misty, that turned out to be a trade name for Carmen, where she worked. She was known as Misty. Mm, interesting. Mm. The impression that she'd gone to Hamilton for work or had received cash to, you know, to do, do whatever she had to do. Mm. Misty was Carmen's alias in the sex industry. Investigators need to determine who is the author of the note containing the money. We got the envelope for that note submitted to ESR and took samples from it with the view of trying to figure out who may have actually handled the item itself. One of the samples provided a partial DNA profile that corresponded to Ms. Thomas's DNA profile and there was an additional trace of DNA from someone else. The trace was such that it was insufficient to use for meaningful comparisons. This, combined with a lack of fingerprints, suggested that whoever had written the note may have worn gloves. Why? Yeah. That's weird. That right? Yeah. Carmen lived in a flat in Auckland with her young child. She had shared custody with her ex-partner, Brad Callahan. It was he who had filed the missing persons report. Okay, okay. Brad was a civil engineer, <laughs> and working and living in a, a relationship with a partner who was seven months pregnant. He was, generally speaking, a clean-cut young man um, with a good background uh, to uh, his life. With Carmen missing, the young son they shared is now in Brad's full-time care. The next step of the investigation was to check Carmen's home. Forensic scientists began a scene examination. With this kind of examination for a missing person, you're really looking for inconsistencies in a pattern of living. Is there something there that shouldn't be there? Is there something missing? Nothing particularly untoward in the, the living area. We looked in the bedrooms, nothing necessarily untoward in there. But once we got to look in the bathroom, and there was blood staining in there that, you know, is indicative of something happening that probably shouldn't be happening in a, in a missing person case. There was smears of blood on the, the front of the basin and dilute blood on the top of the basin next to the sink. There's also, we found uh, quite a, a quantity of dilute blood spots inside the shower, a roundabout from you know, waist height, sort of down, yeah. in a fan kind of pattern much like I'd expect to get if someone turned the tap on and then washed something under the shower that's got blood in it and it's yeah, spat on. that doesn't mean anything, though. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. We looked in I love the main entrance I way, love which is the front I, door, I leads onto a little kitchen, and we off. found small spots of... I, I completely understand that cops have to, you know, obviously do their job, but I always find cops, when they're coming to these type of shows, they assume a lot. Yeah. And but I don't know problem. if that's... I don't know if that's necessarily their job to assume. No, it's supposed not, to not be. Yeah. It's supposed so. to be probable, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> that's kind of not how it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Right yeah. Near the, the floor level of the washing machine. And the, the type of patterning we're finding was very small spots of blood. And to get really small spots of blood, you need a certain amount of energy being applied to an open source of blood. Oh, come on. We also had spots of blood all over the, the <laughs> edge of the, the front door. But it, we weren't sure at that stage whether it was um, the same event that had created the pattern on the front of the washing machine. Because although they're very close to each other, there was nothing sort of connecting the two. The areas were swabbed and sent for DNA analysis. It became apparent that we were looking at something sinister occurring. We've got impact spatter on the floor in the, in the kitchen um, and by the front door and we've got evidence of clean-up in the bathroom. So that creates a, a rather um, unfortunate picture. Yeah. That indicated that something had gone on. I had major concerns for Carmen's well-being. 
Sure you did. You had no fucking clue. To understand more <laughs> about <laughs> one pattern analysis and how scientists can determine what had happened from that patterning, I'm at ESR's Auckland lab. Blood is a very unique fluid. When it reacts with oxygen, it immediately starts to congeal, which makes it behave differently from any other liquid. Today, we're using animal blood. Three main types of bloodstain pattern. Um, passive kind of events, which is just where gravity is the primary force involved. If blood was to drip from a weapon and fall to the ground, it would be a passive blood drop. They're generally round and fat and have no tails. Projected where there's an additional force, whether it's pressure from like an artery or whether it's been flung off a, a weapon. These are more elongated in shape and more directional looking. What we can tell by looking at the, the size of these and the width and the length, uh, we can tell how they've actually struck that surface. So we can get the, the angle of impact um, and the directionality through the, the center of that oval, which means that we can cool. use a, a collection of yeah. these to give us an idea so how do you as to, know as to that where in space the kid didn't have a nosebleed or something like That's that? That's pretty powerful information well, for what happened in the crime scene, like isn't this it? It certainly the aids the reconstruction in like, some cases really until, we, until they find in, out in it's her blood or not, right? scientists so, had yeah. seen the very small droplets of impact spatter. A spatter pattern requires quite a bit of, um, of an input of energy to break the blood up into really small droplets. Looking at what we've got there, we can get a lot of information about what kind of events occurred and where it's actually originated from. There's a lot of features in this that are consistent with what we've actually seen at the apartment, where collections of these very, very fine spots like this. And what does that actually tell us? So they're spots that are traveling really quite fast, created with a lot of energy, because they're really small, and they're flying horizontal to the surface, so across without any influence from gravity, so they're a projected pattern, and created with something like an impact to create the, the very small size of them. On the wall, we've got these lovely directional spots here. So if we use this spot as an example, we can see that it's got a, an oval shape. That indicates that it's struck the surface at an angle. The line that's been thrown off at the top end is part of a wave cast off pattern. And if we draw a line through the wave cast off down through the center of the oval, we can use that to get an idea as to where it's actually come from. And then there's the sort of gap we have between these and then the spatter pattern that goes up the wall here, which is actually, again, very um, consistent with the pattern we, pattern we saw on the, the door in the apartment. The blood pattern yeah, raised my concern yeah, about Carmen's welfare. Some sort of force, physical force, had been used in the scene where someone had bled and bear in mind Carmen was missing, I had to, you know, add that to the complete picture. That night, the investigators used luminol to show up any signs of blood in the flat. There were quite clear white marks in luminol um, on the wall immediately opposite the bathroom door and down the edge of the, the door frame into that bathroom. So someone's made some effort to clean up, but not enough that they've actually taken away any of the blood staining that was immediately visible in the shower and clearly missed some very other obvious patterns of blood staining. We found luminal patterns that looked a lot like footprints on the carpet that was in the sort of lounge dining area. It just showed that someone had walked in blood and transferred it onto the carpet. And they showed quite a bit of activity of someone moving around with probably dilute blood on their feet through that main living area of the unit. Wow. But on the kitchen floor, Underneath the high-impact spatter, where they expected to see a large presence of blood, there was nothing. On those smooth surfaces, the cork tiles, there was just a, a, a greasy residue of some type, interfering effect with the luminal examination itself. Some type of substance on the floor was masking the presence of blood. Was that intentional? I couldn't figure out what it might be at the time. We thought initially that it might be some sort of ignitable liquid that's left a greasy residue, such as kerosene. So we, we took samples from a number of places and, and brought them back and had our, our physical evidence group try and analyze them. In real crime scene investigations, there are no magic machines that can determine what any substance is. 
The chromographic mass spectrometer can only look for matches to over 200,000 substances on file. And there were no matches. One more piece of information came to light at Carmen's apartment. The landlord actually said, oh, look, by the way, you realise her bin's missing. You know, first scan of the address, you wouldn't have thought so because outside were rubbish bins belonging to the number on the street. So that suddenly said, oh, that's interesting. Where is the wheelie bin? The size of the bin, it was the logical way to transport a body. So one of the items of significant interest was where is this bin? Every council rubbish bin has a serial number that identifies exactly which address that bin belongs to. Oh, if we find it somewhere, it might link the murderer to the scene because it is taken from the scene. It's another piece of information that sits in the file, though, until you find the bin and in the circumstances that add context to it, it, it it's just one piece of information. DNA analysis matches the blood spatter in Carmen's apartment to DNA on her toothbrush. The missing persons investigation is now stepped up. With any person that's missing, you start tracking um, their, their course of business uh, to try and get some sort of feel for where they're being, what they're doing, where they work, who their friends are, their neighbours, uh, and you, you just build up that complete picture about that person. Bank records were examined to establish the last time Carmen's account was accessed. So we were able to go back and get the CCD footage. That puts Carmen at a point in place. Well, look, we know she's alive this day because we've got corroborative evidence to show that she's standing in a supermarket with her son spending money. Well, that's the last known physical sighting of Carmen. I expressed to the family that you know, I was uneasy about Carmen's disappearance. Looks but we really asked Carmen's mum yeah, to it go does, to public it? Uh, yeah. for appeals on her sightings. A, to glean information, and B, um, try and advance the investigation. Really just here to help try and find my daughter. If she's out there, her son misses her. He also needs to see his mum. And... Um, I just really wanted to come back. It was hard for Mum, obviously, um, to go on public. They would have had their own fears about it because they all knew that she loved her son. So. I cannot discuss that right now. Sorry. Good afternoon, please. Communication. Yes, hi. It's Brett Cullen speaking. Um, uh, Carmen Thomas. I just, she was due back yesterday to pick up her son and she never turned up. Um, I've been trying to ring her all week and haven't been able to get hold of her. OK, um, what relationship are you to her? Um, I'm, uh, we, we have a son together. OK, so an ex-partner or...? Yeah, ex-partner, yeah. With any missing person file, you have to eliminate uh, the people that report them missing. History is littered with people that have been reported missing that subsequently find out the person that reported them missing is the uh, perpetrator. It's sort of a catch-22 phase is between a victim and a, and a person of interest. Um, so uh, Mr Callaghan, being the ex-partner, uh, was definitely a person of interest um, to us. He's also next of kin and now the sole charge of his and Carmen's child. So by rights he's a victim, so we assign someone to, to liaise with them and, and keep them appraised of the investigation. I asked um, that we get elimination prints and DNA from uh, the son and himself so that we could eliminate anything in the scene. So we would like to have access to your um, phone records and bank records, which he agreed to give us. Data from Carmen's phone was also accessed. Forensic analysis identified some strange anomalies. The first was a change in her phone activity. The key things are the volumes, so how many calls and texts did she do traditionally on a day. If you look at that a month before she goes missing, it's, it's fairly consistent, that pattern, and then it's very infrequent. She went from, say, 50 communications to five or less in a one-day period, and that tailored off after about two weeks. The biggest change in volume happened weeks before she was reported missing. 
and there was a notable difference in the texts. The language appeared to change. It was very subtle changes, but it was significant. Everybody communicates in their own way. People talk and text speak. They'll write letters or phrases. She used the word hun a lot, H-O-N, and it was the way hospital appeared. It would have been hospital as opposed to the full hospital. And what was interesting was that that changed. So that indicated to us that something's wrong and, and that someone's pretending to use her phone. Those are all red flags, if you like, to something's not quite right here. She's not missing, she's, she's possibly dead. If she's dead, then who's pretending to be Carmen and why? And are they the killer? Potential clues could lie in the polling data. Polling data is basically telling you in a general location where someone is. It won't give you a specific point of where they are. It's not like GPS coordinates. It's not an exact science, but it gives you an idea of, of where someone is or the, the location they're in when they're making the voice call or text message. The first anomaly was that her phone had never polled in Hamilton, where her car was found abandoned. We know she's in Hamilton at that stage, or the car's been in Hamilton, so why is there no polling data for Hamilton on her phone? And why is it still all the polling data in Auckland? And exactly where her phone was in Auckland was of even more interest. What became apparent when comparing, say, Carmen's phone to Callahan's phone, they appeared to be communicating, texting each other, but when you looked closer at the polling data, she appeared to be in exactly the same location that his phone was in. On one occasion, he traveled to the North Shore, and we can track him um, as he's traveling to the shore, and the polling data, it's going, you know, Carmen's phone, Brad's phone, as he's traveling up the motorway. And Not it's, the it's brightest character in the world. Phones are in the same vehicle. I mean, there's a text but conversation I like what he was saying. Had, uh, I like that? what he was saying about the polling of the phone, because that is so true. Like, I had an incident where I had to do that actual thing to find out whose phone number was calling a friend that was really trying to hurt them. Yeah. And I had to use a thing online where it did that exact thing. It pulled the location of the phone and found out their location. And I was able to scare the people away by sending them their location through the poll of the phone. It was pretty... Pretty cool to see that and then him just talk about that. So that was pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. Domestic argument. But when you look at the phone, polling data for it, the phones are in exactly the same location. So they're having this, this alleged argument when they could be in the same room. Brad Callahan moves from person of interest to prime suspect. Police investigate Callahan's activities up to and around the time Carmen is reported missing. Through his bank records, they can determine where he's been. We had the CCTV footage from the day that she went missing. Callahan's arms crossed, head down, walking into the supermarket. You could see that he was under some extreme pressure or something heavy on his mind. It's in the middle of a working day. His colleague from work suddenly joined him out of the blue. The things just don't look right. We obtained what they'd bought, and it was cleaning products and plastic bags. That whole picture did not look good. His work colleague becomes a person of interest, and Callahan is now being closely monitored. His pattern of behaviour was to wake up in the morning, take his son to school, and then he would usually get to work at about nine o'clock in the morning. Further investigation revealed he did something out of character. We established that he'd gone to work one early morning. When you spoke to these contractors on site, said this was totally out of character. He came out from the, from the depths of the site in the middle of the night. They thought, you know, early hours of the morning, they thought, well, we've never seen him on site. He was, wasn't in his vest. He was, you know, you know, didn't make sense, but hey, he's a structural engineer, he can do what he likes. They then reported that they were putting in the foundations to uh, the site, which were quite massive. They said that when they went and dropped the steel in one particular hole, it was a metre proud, which these companies work in exacts. They don't drill a hole and make it a metre short. When they brought it to Callahan's attention, you know, that it was a metre proud of the steel poking out there, he just said, I'll cut it off and it'll do. 
they thought that was weird, uh, that it didn't follow protocol. So we thought, hell, that doesn't match. Clearly there's something down there that shouldn't be there. And this the timing of Brad being on site early in the morning when the concrete was going to be poured into this large hole, and it was a logical place from our point of view for a body to be disposed of. Police shut down construction work and excavated the footing. There's a big hole put down the side of that particular footing. Cut a hole and dug it all out. Take all the concrete out of there and um, see if we can find this body at the bottom of this hole. Screeded every piece of bit that came out of there and you know, ultimately it led to nothing evidentially significant. So um, that was a bit disappointing, but had to be done. Just as they were losing hope, an unexpected lead was discovered. So at the end of that stage with the site, we were tidying up and the foreman and came to us and told us about this strange bin. They then purported that uh, their caravan, which they used to have smoke on, had a horrible stench and they thought it was their caravan. So they, they thought they'd better clean the caravan out, so they did. And as they went to fill up a, a wheelie bin nearby, they lifted it up, the, the worker described it as just like piss and shit. It was such a terrible smell, and there was these bags in this wheelie bin, but they didn't, you know, they closed the wheelie bin and moved the wheelie bin away, and the stench went away. Could this be the missing bin from Carmen Thomas's flat? No. And they found that the serial number had been scoused out of it, so it's all kept that to the ESR. Staff went there and collected it. Is this the missing bin? Will science reveal the serial number? And can that identify Carmen's killer? Police had suspected a wheelie bin was used to transport Carmen's body from her apartment. Now scientists needed to establish where the bin found at Callahan's work came from. Most serial numbers are typically stamped into things like metals, um, engine blocks from cars, uh, chassis numbers. So we don't get an awful lot of them in plastic, but the fundamental principles apply. But you didn't know it would work on a wheelie bin, did you? No, the research that's out there that's been done on plastics is typically done on small items that get numbers put on them. And the techniques are, are usually they put them in an oven and heat them up slowly. I didn't have an oven big enough for the wheelie bin, so we sort of had to adapt the practice just a little bit. Ryan was in uncharted territory. He had one wheelie bin and one chance. Firstly, he started preparing the surface. All right, so the purpose of the sanding is just to take off the, the rougher areas of the plastic, just get it smooth enough so when we start to heat it, the plastic starts to relax and the stresses underneath allow it to sort of become proud again. If we take too much off, we lose that. He added some gentle heat. These are just photography studio lights. That's our light. Well, that's warm, isn't it? Yeah, it gets quite hot. And the thing is, too much heat will destroy everything. So we've just gently started to warm up the surface and tried to get it to relax and for the, the mechanical memory of the, the polymers that have been stressed behind the serial number to sort of come back to their original shape. And because there's been plastic removed when it's wow. ground off, that original shape sits proud of the surface, it pokes out. Look at that. Yeah, wow. in, in just the right position, look at that light, you should be able to see the numbers. Wow. Just got to get the light in the right spot and easy, number done. One, two, three, eight, six, five. Very good. It's so clear, isn't it? When it works, it works. All the numbers have come back, perfect restoration. When it works, it works. That was good. To give them results. The serial number was matched to council records. That bin belonged to where Callahan lived next door. It was a bin signed to that to the neighbour. So I said, "Well, go around to the address and see whose bin they've got." And then we found Carmen's bin two doors up from Callahan's address. So the obvious question, well, how did her wheelie bin get so close to his address and why is it not at her address? So we've got a dance of the wheelie bins occurring around Mr Kelleher's place. That certainly raises some questions. We were able to clearly show that that bin could only got there by one person. 
The bin belonging to Carmen's flat was sent to ESR for DNA and luminol testing. As you can imagine, examining a bin itself is actually quite difficult, so we cut the bin in half lengthways and open it up in order to do that exam and found a number of areas where we got positive results with the luminol, which indicates that there, there could well be blood present. And one of the samples from the inside of the bin near the base did give us a DNA profile for Ms. Thomas. It wasn't definitive evidence, but it supported the theory that the large bin could have been used to remove her body from the flat. The hunt was on to try and where is, where, we still haven't got her body, where is her body? Because most homicide investigations, that's where you start from. You've got the body from day one, and it's very rare that you get into a situation like this where it's a missing person, you've got no idea where the body is, you've got, you've got your prime suspect um, who's doing very odd things, but you still don't know what's he done with her, where, where has he put her. Police traced Callahan's movements through his phone polling data. Had he been anywhere unusual, somewhere he could have dumped the body? He went into the Furfa Thames and it misses because there's no coverage. And then he comes back out on the Bombay side of the Furfa Thames and the next night he's up on the Bombay side of the Furfa Thames and then comes back and pings out at the other end. You know, he's a working guy. He works Monday to Friday. Um, he's got a pregnant wife at home. Um, and then in the middle of the night, he's circling the Firth of Thames, do, doing these massive drives. We thought she was somewhere there, so we had Eagle fly over it. We had the, the night vision camera on. We were looking for any property that may have been discarded along the road. Had he stopped anywhere? Had he driven off track? An extensive search of the Firth of Thames turns up nothing. The police investigation now established that Callahan has started operating a second mobile phone. These phone records are accessed to track his movements. Finding that phone was essential. And as we're scrolling down, you're getting the addresses. It's going Auckland, Huntley, and then Hamilton. And that, that was, you know, that was gold. It was absolute gold. That shows that Callahan was in Hamilton near the time the car was dumped there. As was one of his associates. He ultimately helped pick him up after depositing the car down in Hamilton. We were able to track the fact that the, you know, they traveled, you know, their phones traveled to that area. The time had come that we had enough evidence to basically go and make the arrest. Three months after Carmen Thomas was reported missing, Brad Callahan is officially arrested. But the investigation is still far from over. We were building up our strategies around collecting the right amount of evidence and putting it into some sort of case. Police continued with the task of gathering evidence. The note found in Carmen's car was always thought to be a clue to the last person who saw her alive. It had some links uh, to Mr Callaghan through the, the nature of the word used in Hun. The uh, handwriting was similar. Similar enough to be scientific evidence? Oh. Samples were gathered for document examination. We searched his address for uh, handwriting samples and uh, we took every document we could find, whether it's a diary, whether it's just a scribbled note. To discover more about the science of document examination, I'm meeting with Gordon Scharf. So, Gordon, I brought you a couple of documents, a couple of things that I've written. How would you go about analysing this writing? We go through the material, making notes on the size of the letters, the spacing, measure the slope, but we also look at the individual constructions of each letter. So, for example, your letter E, you make that with a C shape and then a stroke off the centre, whereas someone else might make it with an L and then two strokes, or four separate strokes or upward movement in two strokes. With an O, you can make it in a anti-clockwise direction or you can make it in a clockwise direction. So you can tell the direction of, of the pen stroke? Yes. And by microscopically examining the ink line, we can see characteristics in the ink line which tell us which direction the pen oh, is wow. moving in. Hmm. 
Under the microscope, the detail of my writing style can be examined. Here we can see a heavy deposit of ink where there's been a change in direction from the pen coming in. We can see what we call a, a matchstick, and that denotes the start of a stroke because what's happened there is the pen's finished the previous stroke and then has moved up to this, this new letter. And so there's not very much ink left on the ball until it starts rolling again. And so you get this non-inking start. And we can see these little white lines, which are called striations. They're what called, are they exactly? They're caused by faults on the ball housing in a, in a ballpoint pen that actually wipes the ink off as it's rolling around. With the T, you're getting a, a striation which runs off the end of the line, so that shows that this T stroke is being made from left to right rather than from right to left. There's a lot of information there, isn't there? It's a very long process to that go is through intense. every and letter that is awesome. to check on how it's made. Are some words more significant than others? Words that you write often, often become like a miniature signature. Like and or on or the. Yeah, the, the, yeah. for some people these become yeah, very identifiable even though they're so small because they have a, a, uh, a mental pattern as to how they write it. And those are words you don't think about. You start and then the, the motor program takes over in your brain and runs, runs your hand. This is, this is what we're looking for when we're doing a handwriting comparison, these habits which are happening subconsciously. So the envelope that was found in the car, what were you able to tell from that envelope? So this is the court comparison chart um, after we've done our examination. You can see the high back on the, the A, um, this construction of K with the staff drawn into the bowl. Here we're looking at um, interletter connections, so the S and the T connection coming through in the specimens as well. Can you say that they are both written by that person? And found a number of similarities between question writing and Barry Callahan's um, handwriting. It's strongly supported that he had placed and written the note in and placed it in the car with the cash to leave the impression that she'd gone to Hamilton for work. The case is building, but investigators still need stronger evidence and haven't lost hope of finding Carmen's body. Brad Callahan is arrested for Carmen's murder, but with no body and a case based on circumstantial evidence, investigators hope the forensic examination of his car will reveal more. It became immediately apparent that something wasn't right with his car. A piece of household carpet that had been cut out and inserted, cut to shape and inserted into the boot where the original boot lining would have, would have been. He had painted some areas black, quite obviously, because there were runs of paint. Looking in the boot of his vehicle, uh, at the back edge of the back seat, we started to find some blood staining soaked into the foam on the seat back. We followed that by taking the, the actual back seats out and underneath the back seats there was blood staining all over the underside and runs of blood down the, the inside of the chassis of the car. Wow. So there was enough blood in there at some point for it to be flowing and running under the seats onto the chassis. Samples were taken of uh, the blood staining that we found and we got a DNA profile from Miss Thomas. Uh, the stench was unreal because the blood had soaked straight into that foam and started to rot and uh, started to break down and it was, yeah, it was massive. So there must have been a lot of blood in that bin. And what he did to mask that smell, which was fairly horrific, was use air freshener. So a can of air freshener sitting in the passenger well of the vehicle, and he would just get into the car, spray the air freshener as he transported his son to school and, and went about his daily business. We did reenactments with the bin, seeing if we could get the bin into the car by yourself and and it was, yeah, very, chuck the seats down, very straightforward and very easy. One other thing we did find on Mr Kelleher's car was on the inside of the rear windscreen, there were a couple of little marks about yay far apart, just smudge marks on, on the inside of the glass that looked like they you would expect from where the wheels of the wheelie bin would contact it um, if it were put into the boot with the, the wheels up against the windscreen. When we did the reenactment and when you placed the wheelie bin in the vehicle, you could see where the wheel marks lined up perfectly on the glass with the wheelie bin marks. 
and you could see the way the bin was placed in the vehicle with the wheels up that the lid opened at the bottom and then the blood would have just flowed straight back into the car. The examination of Callahan's address fails to find anything of significance, but his computers are seized for forensic examination. The search term perfect murder was done on the 28th of July 2009. One year ago to the date, he researched how to best knock out someone and kill them. So there was some really key evidence of some emotive or premeditation. He'd researched how to get rid of blood, how to dispose of blood from a house. There was uh, nearly 2,500 entries for the term blood. <laughs> some searches on how to clean up crime scenes and looking at police investigative techniques to, um, to cover, it, cover your tracks. He had looked wow. at things on his computer like how to dispose Stupid. of remains and yep. those sorts of search terms. And also um, how to um, dismember a body. Um, he he well, researched nice. that, so quite clinical. Police now knew from a witness account that Brad had tried to involve his friend in disposing of the dismembered remains. He contacted his mate, who he knew had a boat, and he basically confesses to his mate that this is what I've done. She's in the back of the car. At that stage, Carmen's body is being dismembered, and it's in concrete and plastic containers. Brad's plan is to pick up the containers and put them overboard and dispose of their body that way. Brad's plan to dump Carmen's body at sea fails. And the mate basically has the gumption to say, look, I don't want to be any part of this plan. I'm not getting involved in this. You're on your, you're on your own. This friend was later granted immunity from prosecution. Callahan's behavior was becoming noticeably different. Well, what what did him alive, wrong. what he'd done, and I don't think it was so much hey, about... Wait, pause this, pause this for one second. I have to ask this one he'd question. Done to her, I think. The mate literally, he went to the mate and said, I killed a girl, please let me use your boat so we can dump this body. The guy says, no, I'm not up for it. And then they grant him immunity? Why would they even grant him immunity? He didn't do nothing wrong. He did the right thing. He walked away from that situation. So why would he even be looked at as a suspect? That's well, no, what I don't no, understand. what? Well, no, they said he did drive the boat, but it didn't work. Oh, that's what he said. Oh, yeah. okay. Because I was yeah. one. I was like, I didn't hear that part. I was like, that yeah. was a little weird. Yeah, it didn't work out. So that's why he got. It was more oh, I about they meant... I'm going to oh. get caught, yeah, and, okay. and he was trying to get his way out of it, and it just. He was, he was digging himself deeper and deeper into a hole. Nine days after his arrest, Callahan, through his lawyer, finally reveals to the police where he buried Carmen's remains. It was in thick bush. It was reasonably steep terrain. It had been raining for a wee while beforehand, so the ground was wet. So the ESR arrived and began um, basically a hands and knees search of that particular grid. There were two holes or two burial sites uh, very close to each other. One had the main um, main storage bin, the 40 litre bin, and the other one had the other um, parts in it. There's particular, particular cases that will always probably stand out. Uh, and this was one of them, one, because it was such a unique scene. All the um, tapui that goes with a site like that. We got the local Kamato to come through, and that's an emotional feeling, you know, getting them to bless a site. It was actually really Might eerie be because the bush, with its own canopy and its own sounds and light filters and things like that, it actually created a sort of an, it was an eerie silence. So that made you sort of stop and, and, and take stock of, of what you were hearing. Carmen's remains were respectfully removed and examined by a pathologist. The concrete had actually sealed most of the, the air out of, of the bins themselves, as did the plastic bags, and the body itself was, was not in what you would consider very good condition. So the, the post-mortem was a particularly gruelling endeavour for those that were involved. Cause of death was determined as blunt force trauma. The fatal blow was such that it 
radiated right around and split the, the skull. Sadly, it didn't get so Carmen sad. back alive, but she was dead before we started it, so we're never going to do that. Carmen Thomas had been murdered 12 days before Brad Callahan reported her missing. During that time, he'd used her phone to keep up the pretense of her being alive. He'd driven her car to Hamilton, planted notes to make her disappearance seem linked to others, and he'd involved three associates in his complicated web of deceit. So why? At trial, Callahan alleged Carmen had asked him to her place to discuss their child's schooling, and this led to a heated argument. He made submissions that it was um, the fact that she told him he wasn't the father of the child and lost the plot, and it was a rage, and he picked up the first thing he could find, which was his son's baseball bat, and hit her. But he hit her more than once. Brad Callahan pleaded guilty to murder and attempting to pervert the course of justice. He got the, the strongest send-off that you could for the nature of his crime, not only killing Carmen, but the extent that he went to you know, pervert the course of justice, and that added to his sentence a non-parole period of 13 years, seven months. We were very satisfied with the outcome, though we take no satisfaction in a victim dying. You know, but all we can do is the best for the victim and get some justice for the family members. And I thank my team and all the police that attended for a fantastic effort, hard yards. There's an element of passion that the crime scene people bring to this work. And once we get involved, we, we put that passion into ensuring that everything we can answer as far as the scientific questions does get answered. She was a, a good mother. Sad. Sad with the boy, especially his father and now his mother, both taken out of the picture. So, tragedy all around, really. No, it's so sad. Lost both parents. Yeah, you know. There is no averting the tragedy of this case, but it's thanks to the hard work of forensic investigators that cases like this are solved, bringing some sense of justice to all of us. That's it. Wow. I tell you, that... what a... Go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, like, what a sad, sad case, but at the same time, the way that they portrayed everything out scientifically and to hear about that scientific base behind everything was very fascinating but this whole case in general is just so sad a child lost not just the mother but a father as well i mean you know in this like i mean not the father deserved to go away but you know what at the point of after the mother's gone it's like you know now the kid suffers even worse over it you know he tried it's to be like, smart and he then, tried but it didn't he work tried out to be smart yeah, but he tried all right. Everything he tried backfired on him, right? Yeah. Or everything he was doing, somehow they found it. Like, uh, you know. Like, I never knew that about the plastic bins. Like, you, if you scrape it off or something, the number, and then all of a sudden you reapply a, a just a photo light from a studio, a photo studio heat, and it'll reappear the image on the... On, I never knew that. That is the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, yeah. And then like, you know, I never own... knew they could do that. You never use your own computer when you're... Well, duh. You're... I mean, you... <laughs> and you don't ever tell anybody, obviously, either, if you're smart, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But these people are that, we, yeah. that we've that we encountered so far, man, on this show for the past 11 cases. It just... Some of them are very intelligent, but yeah. then some of them are so intelligent, they're stupid. And it's just yeah. like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? Guys it's good. Okay, do the voice again. The All high right. one. The high one. What would you like me to say? Goodbye to everybody that watched today. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for watching Crime Documentaries. Case closed.